Good morning. It's just about sunrise here at Cerro Gordo, and I've been living in this abandoned mining town for the past 18 months. And my life these days is a lot different than it was a year and a half ago. So in this video, I'm gonna try to show you a typical week up here, you know, how I occupy my time, and hopefully give a little bit more of a behind the scenes look at Ghost Town Living. All right, so let's set the stage for those of you who might not know. Right now, I'm sitting at Cerro Gordo. And back in the 1800s, Cerro Gordo was a booming mining town. They pulled something like $500 million of minerals out of the hills around me. And back then, there was like 4,000 people that lived here. And the mine went bust around 1920. You know, that's when they kind of ran out of ore. And for the past 100 years, it sat here mostly abandoned, you know, save the lone caretaker or two. And I bought this town three years ago with the hope of creating this destination for people to come up, stay, experience the history and the natural beauty here. And I thought I knew what I was doing, but for the first year and a half, I was flying in and out of Austin. But when the pandemic hit in 2020, I came up here to live full time. And so for the past 19 months, I've been living here every single day. And I've just fallen in love with this place more than I thought it was possible to fall in love with any building or piece of land. And so I spend my days restoring the old buildings and trying to understand the history here to preserve both for future generations. So on that, let's get into this week and uh, see what happens. Today's Monday, it's very windy. And the first place I wanna show you guys is where I stay. When I first moved up to Cerro Gordo, I stayed in the Belshaw house, which was the house of Mortimer Belshaw back in the day. And he was one of the main founders of this town. He ended up owning pretty much everything back in the 1860s. And after he left, the town sat dormant for a while and eventually became a zinc mine thanks to a guy named L.D. Gordon who built this house. And L.D. originally came to Cerro Gordo around 1910 and built this house in, oh, 1915 or 1916. And the idea of this house was to build such a fancy house that his wife would want to move up to the mining camp. And so LD built it and wife still didn't want to move up here. <laughs> but these days, it's where I live with a whole bunch of cats. Oh, Levi. These are, uh, these are the guys. Levi right here. Hello, he's my new adventure partner. Levi, you look great. That's Gordo, that's the OG here in the cat kingdom. There's Lola. This is the kitchen. I know I said a lot of things have changed, but some have stayed the exact same, including what I have for breakfast. Breakfast, pretty much every single morning is... Hey there, I need to order uh, a decent amount of, of block for a basement that I'm doing. Um, is it best to try to get that over the phone or should I send it to you or what's the best way to go about that? Tell me the information? Yeah, that might be awesome. All right, so blah, blah, blah. All the boring work stuff is done during the middle of the day. And it's clearing up a little bit, as you can see behind me, which is nice. And it's just about time to go down there and get the backhoe. <laughs> that's gonna take me probably about three hours, but that's the plan, you know? There's no other way to get it up here. So I'm excited to have it here and put it pretty much immediately to use. So without further ado, Let's head down that way. All right, you know what it is. The backhoe is back. And if the backhoe is back, that means progress is about to happen. Now what's about to go down is the next step of the American Hotel is about to begin. Block for the basement. 
Standing in between me and starting that is this seven mile dirt road and me in a backhoe. And just like that, a quick two hours later, <laughs> the loader is back at Cerro Gordo. So right now you can see I'm at a former cabin site here at Cerro Gordo. It's a little bit behind the town core, just below the main mine. And if you look at all the boards here, they all are just full of square nails. That means this is one of the original cabins. You know, this is a 1800s cabin that has obviously since fallen down. But here, there's almost what looks like, like a dynamite vault or the start of a portal or maybe an old root cellar. You know, it's really interesting that it's just built into the side and then above it, there's like this chimney coming out of the dirt. And so obviously I want to incorporate this into anything I might build here. But right now, if you look around, there's absolutely no road here. And so what I need to do is cut in a road so there's some type of access here. All right, so the backhoe is here. I scouted the cabin site for tomorrow. I got a game plan. I'm gonna start cutting in a road early in the morning, but for tonight, I think I'm gonna take you guys to a part of the property I very rarely go to. You know, the weather's pretty good right now, and the weather looks intermittent for the rest of the week. So, we are going to take a trip to the backside of the property, to a cabin, well, cabin is not a, a little bit of an exaggeration, a structure I rebuilt maybe six months ago that's by these mines, and the sunsets there are just stunning. You know, I have my go-to spot, which I'll get to later this week. But I think tonight, since the weather might be the best it's gonna be all week, I'm gonna take a hike out to this place and we'll do a little checkup. You know, I haven't been back there maybe six months, so I'm really curious to see what the cabin site looks like and to see what the sunset will be. So with that, I'm gonna get my dirt bike to go to the trailhead to take a hike to get to a mine and a cabin. That is the plan. Let's see what happens. <laughs> My structure is still up in some capacity. It's also just looking beautiful out here. I think we're in for quite a sunset. So I'm gonna try to make it down to that beforehand. You know, what first got me about Cerro Gordo was just the history of the town itself and everything that happened there. I think what's kept me here for 18 months is not just the history, but the natural beauty all around this town. Right now, we're on the back side of the property overlooking Death Valley National Park. I just love being able to unwind at the end of the day, you know, unplug and just have this as literally my backyard. You know, I feel really fortunate to have this. You know, after spending time living in places like New York or bigger cities, it's just a different life out here.
Welcome to Tuesday. The plan today is I gotta do a little bit of work in the morning, then I'm gonna try to start go clearing that cabin site. You know, I only have the backhoe for so long, so I try to put it to use as much as possible. And plus, I love moving around dirt at Cerro Gordo. One, cause you know, it's visible progress, but two, anytime you start moving around dirt, there's a chance you might find something. And so I imagine today, as I'm cutting in this road to an old cabin, we might unearth all sorts of cool things. So I'm really excited about that. Somebody made and sent me this mug and I was gonna write them back, but I lost the letter they sent it with. So uh, if you sent me this mug, thank you very much. I use it almost every morning. Well, I timed my uh, breakfast wrong because I didn't quite finish it and I'm on a, a call. So uh, I'm gonna go. Tuesdays are pretty much my admin days. So after breakfast, I usually jump into emails. I'm not gonna subject you guys to watching me do emails for that long a time, but I do have a day job, you know, that I have to do to pay for everything you see at Cerro Gordo. And that job is called Brass Check is the name of the company. And so we work with a lot of authors to help them do everything from write their books, promote their books, all sorts of different book stuff. And as part of that, we have an e-commerce website as well. So my main job within Brass Check is just coordinating with all of the employees. So I'll call everybody, make sure things are going as they should. And after that, I'll do any of the admin stuff that I need to do for Cerro Gordo. So today we're looking for treasure. And there's a few things that give me confidence that all this won't be in vain. Number one, if you think back in the day, Cerro Gordo had hundreds of buildings and thousands of residents. They also had no bank. So in my mind, when I think thousands of people, no bank, that means a lot of hidden treasure. And these aren't just tall tales. You know, the old owner of Cerro Gordo, Mike, back in the day, found a coffee can full of gold coins. This is a fact. I've seen photos of it. I've met the guy who bought them off of him. Also, later in Mike's career, he was digging around up by the hoist house and he discovered a basement to a building that no longer existed. You know, just like dirt, but there's a hole. And as he started digging it out, it turns out that this basement had shelves in it. And on the shelves was six pairs of pristine original Levi's. And if you know me, you know that I am borderline obsessed with finding Levi's for a variety of reasons that we don't have to get into right now. All that to say, they're what I'm always looking for. So if they've been found in that way before, I feel like they can be found in that way again. All right, you know, it's now time to cut in that road. I actually love using the backhoe. It's like a giant toy. And so this is kind of my marker, that piece of wood where I'm gonna cut in. This is gonna be a heck of a, a heck of a road to cut in. But uh, if you got a backhoe, use it. Not even into it yet. And we got the whole bottle, old medicine bottle, a full on shoe. And look at this thing. This is a, uh, it says, oh, hair dye. No way, look, hair dye, liquid, number one, bachelor's, bachelor's hair dye. That is amazing. <laughs> I'm making serious progress. I gotta do a little careful between my balancing act of finding treasure versus getting progress done, but I think I'm gonna get up there almost today even. But the most recent find, look at this little bottle says cold pressed East India oil on it in remarkable shape. I found a couple more of these smaller ones earlier that I didn't get on camera. I'll put over there in that wheelbarrow. There's a lot of stuff in here. All right, so this afternoon is gonna take a little bit of a detour. Uh, Tim called and Tim really wants to explore this mine 
that's over on public land by the park. I'm gonna go pick up Tim and we'll be on the way if this guy gets out of the way and we don't run them over. All right, so we were on our way to explore a mine, uh, kind of in a deep part of Death Valley, and we came across a guy hiking on a road who had just walked eight miles down because his family had gotten their spinter van stuck. And so I'm with Tim, and we're gonna try to get the spinter van unstuck. Um, we have Scotty's Jeep, no tow straps, so let's see what happens. Yep. What do you think, Sky? No way, we should get this out. <laughs> no fucking way. Tim's busy on the job already. So just to put it in perspective, we are in the middle of nowhere, nowhere. Like nobody goes on this road. There's actually a sign seven miles that way that says no outlet. So there's no reason or not, not a through road. So there's no reason to go on this road. If you look around us, you can look that we're just so far removed from anything. So uh, we'll see what happens. I hope we can get these guys out. You know, the sun will set and it's been getting cold, cold the last few days. So we're going to see what happens. I mean, we got some climbing rope. I mean, I can sacrifice one rope because I have two ropes. We know we have two ropes. I think it'll be okay. The small rope, if you want to do it that way, if you do like multiple rounds. Yeah, let's multiple, try it. Multiple, multiple connections, because then you're not putting too much stress on the rope. But I would never use that rope for climbing, climbing ever again if we pull it. It's fine. Okay. If you so let's do that. Do it a bunch of times around and then, uh, yeah, this is going to be heavy. Go, yeah, ah. <laughs> oh, cool! Nice! What? Nice! Well, we gotta get in position back on the road now. Yeah. So, I'm gonna unhook you Nice to meet you guys. Glad you got out safe. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. helping us. Yeah, of no course. problem. Yeah. Have a good rest All of your right. trip. You so Bye. Much. Bye. <laughs> What's it? What do you think? Another successful mission? Yeah. This was a drive the wash. Is why they got stuck. They should have been walking the wash. Yeah. That's where they got problems. <laughs> All right. So we're back. We're going to check out another mine. After saving those people's lives, thanks to Tim. Yes. We're gonna do some roping. We're gonna do some exploring. Where are we going? Well, we could go down there if you want to take a look at that. Is that what you're thinking about or are you thinking about something else? Something else. Look at that. Keep going. See this? Yeah, it's a compressed air tank. It's a manifold. Looks pretty fun. Put the f***ing galena in the roof up. 
up here. Right. All right, so check this out. We're way back in the lowest level of this mine, and there's this cool ore chute, and then what well, might be a changing room because all the old hooks. And you come over here, and boom! <laughs> Look at that. An ore cart on kind of a horizontal winds. You can see it's still on the track, headed down. So there must be a much lower level down that way where they were filling up these carts, bringing them back up here, dumping them under the track that you can kind of see there. Yeah, we're going back up to get the rest of the rope. And the plan is just to continue that down, see where it goes. <clears throat> oh, that's cool. It goes down quite a ways. And look at that, just perfect. It's the end of the rope, end of 500 feet. You can see way back up there that I was walking through. And uh, it's the end of the road here too. I'll unclip, see what's down here. Doesn't look like to be too much. But there's some really cool sub-levels on the way down. Look at this. They're not Levi's, but uh, like old waders, you know, waterproof pants. Guy was wearing. Got this homemade suspenders up there. The suspender class. Must have been wet. But those are kind of coveralls, you know, modern coveralls. And I'll call that a pretty good exploration for one that wasn't necessarily planned and kind of last minute in the afternoon. That worked out pretty good. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you know that I found this briefcase early on in my stay here. And it just has everything in it about this miner's life. You know, old checks from over a hundred years ago, bank statements, divorce settlements, everything. And I'm working on this video right now about the day in the life of a miner. And so by going through this, I can really put myself in the headspace of being a miner back in the day. You know, without a doubt, my favorite part about Cerro Gordo and the whole experience here is just learning about history. You know, I just love history from this part of America and learning about it. And to be here just makes it that much more rich. And I found this briefcase almost one of my first days up here and I kind of forgot about it to be honest with you but inside of it it kind of paints the picture of a guy's life here at Cerro Gordo. The guy's name is Chet Reynolds and he moved up here after Cerro Gordo's heyday you know so the main boom here was 1865 to about 1880 and then L.D. Gordon whose house I'm sitting in right now came up here in 1910 and then he brought a zinc boom for another 10 or 20 years. And this guy obviously came here after the fact and he wanted to bring life back to this town. You know, he saw more in Cerro Gordo than anybody else did. You know, he thought there was another life to be had here, which, you know, obviously resonates quite a bit with me given what I'm trying to do. But as you start going through the other documents, you know, it paints a much more realistic picture of what life is like both for the miners, but also just life generally. You know, if you go through them, one of the first things you find is his different mining leases. The heck is that? Anyways, one of the first things you find in his uh, briefcase is his mining leases, you know, where he was staking claims. And even then, you can kind of see what could be a problem in the future. You know, like, for example, if he does happen to prove a bona fide load here, he owes the guy who's leasing it to him 30% of any and all ores blocked out. A couple months later, 
He obviously had found some ore, so I imagine his emotions must have been pretty high. You know, it's the excitement of being up here, the way that this mountain just entrances you into his kind of mystery. And the first kind of blow came from a company called the Utah Junk Company. With the smelter at 440 at St. Louis, I do not think it would be profitable to ship your zinc ore so far. He found the ore, but the ore wasn't selling. Shortly thereafter, he has his first of two lawsuits. And this one is for back wages. Uh, he didn't pay $10.66 to a lumber and supply company in Lone Pine, and they sued him. So he obviously was having difficult financial time at that point of his life. And the kind of nail in the coffin is about six months later, there's a divorce lawsuit. The same is hereby dissolved upon the grounds of extreme cruelty. You figure he came up here, you know, thinking that he was gonna live the American dream, strike it rich, probably, you know, put his wife up in a beautiful house like L.D. Gordon did, and instead he finds himself bankrupt, you know, divorced, and in a lot of legal trouble. And that's really the tale of most people that came west, you know, of the hundreds of thousands of people that came to California for the gold rush, very few ever made it. You know, that that was just, we hear about those stories just because that's the way that we tell the, the history of America. There's this door that keeps opening and closing. Um, but the reality is, is that it's not the case, you know? And so for me, when I think about that, and I think that through, obviously I came up here with my own ambitions, you know, my ideas of bringing this town back to life, that Cerro Gordo could finally be more than, you know, everybody else thought it could be. And I think what reading through these reminds me is that I have to truly love the process. You know, I have to love the process, not just the outcome. You know, if the outcome for Chet was to strike it rich, his whole time up here is disappointment. But if he could have, you know, along the way, trying to have been learning and experiencing it as he was here, maybe it would have been a different story. But this mountain just has a way of allowing you to think of nothing else existing in the world except for here. You know, it puts you under a spell. Like when I'm here, the only place I want to be is here. When I go to the town to get to a supply run, I immediately want to come back. It just brings out this part of you that just believes truly that there's more to be had here and you're willing to literally live, give your life to do that. You know, previous owners since me have done that. Um, countless miners, you know, all sorts of different people. That's what I'm kind of thinking about before going to bed tonight, you know, just being in this town for so long and being around these ghosts or whatever's making all the noise over there or all these relics from the past just brings that grounding nature to me that I find very helpful. And that's it. Another day retired, the afterglow still lingering in the air over the Sierras. Pretty good life, hard to complain a lot. Hello Wednesday, the plan today is to continue cutting in that road, see what other artifacts we can find try to clear the cabin site to kind of get that project a little closer to being done so that way later in the week I can focus on the American Hotel. And later, after I do that, I'll bring everything into the museum and I'll show you guys a little bit of an update of what's been going on in the museum here. All right, so this is a pretty uh, successful scoop. Look at this. There's some straight up old cowboy boots. See that? Got a boot there. Got old man's second boot there. And then right next to it, the first full bottle of the hall. You can see applied lip. We're talking 1800s bottle. Old. You know, poor old guy left his boots and his whiskey. <laughs> Dude, what's this? Some old, uh, let's say. Oh, you know what that might be? Oh man, I think. I think that's a Chinese tin. I think that's Chinese lettering on it. That is so cool. All right, we're gonna be a little more careful in this area. All right, making progress. As you can see, it's now at least 
cut in enough where I can get the backhoe into it, which is good because I can keep this road clear. All right, now we're talking. Look at this. Oh, this is one of those stoner beer bottles. I believe I found a lot of, but look, this one has a label on it. I've never seen one with a label ever. Would you look at that? I got the backhoe to the beginning of the site. That was my goal today, you know, just access. Is the road pretty? No, of course not. But could you get a truck back it up to here to load up some wood? Yes, you could. And if access was the goal today, then access has been granted. I've never had the patience really to metal detect, but given that all this dirt has been buried for a very long time and it's now exposed, it would seem if there's ever a chance to find some buried coins or something, it might be now. So I might budget 15, 20 minutes and break out the metal detector over there and see if I can't find some cool stuff. Well, 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 maybe I just didn't give metal detecting a chance. You know, I, I set up the camera up there and I was expecting you to just see me scanning and finding absolutely nothing. But look at this, it's an ax head. This is a crazy ax head too. It's like extremely old, still sharp. I mean, I could probably still cut wood today. I gotta admit that is the coolest thing I have found with a metal detector yet and it came two minutes after setting up that camera and starting in on it. That is freaking awesome, actually. And it does, again, seems like it's all coming from this area. And so I am curious. I know I just kind of made my road good enough, but now I kind of want to scratch around in here with a rake and see if I can't pull some more stuff from this hillside, because it seems that this might've been the dump for whatever type of structure they had up there. Well, good. Looks like I've done a proper job of messing up basically everything that I had uh, done earlier. So I did find a lot of junk. Ta-da, but no real treasures. Well, you know what I learned again today while using the metal detecting is that me and metal detecting don't really necessarily mix. Uh, the patience thing isn't there. I just always feel like I have better things to do. But during my metal, metal detecting time, I did think of a good idea. So what I wanna do is I wanna go metal detecting with all of you guys. So if you're out there, you watch this channel and you've metal detected before and you've ever wanted to metal detect at Cerro Gordo, why don't we just get a massive crew? Why don't we get 20, 100 people out here all metal detecting over a weekend and then at the end of the weekend we can compare and see what we found and maybe even prizes for the best thing found. You know, obviously everything would have to stay here at Cerro Gordo in the museum. If you're out there and you like metal detecting and you want to come to Cerro Gordo Metal Detect, email this email address on the screen. I haven't made the email address. I literally just thought of this, but I think that's a good idea. I think we could find some really cool treasure and we put a little plaque up in the museum, you know, whoever found it or who knows, maybe the person who found it could get a stay at the American Hotel or something like that. So hit up that email address. Let me know below if you're in. I found this recipe online that you put vinegar, salt, and water together and you boil it and apparently that'll take any grime off of copper and i think that that chinese tea box lid that i found earlier was copper and so i'm gonna try to clean it up and see if we can't read the lettering on it i vouch for it if you ever got copper you need to clean it up vinegar salt and water works like a charm I mean, any way you look at it, that's a win. Look at that. Compared to how it was, that is pretty awesome. Welcome to the museum. This is where anything that I find gets put. We'll go back to the things I just found while cutting the road, but yeah, if you watch my videos, you'll recognize this setting. I do a lot of videos there. I found this newspaper the other day in a mine. And if you look, 1925, it's basically exactly how it was the day it was printed. It shows automotives and it shows the price of a 
five passenger sedan for two thousand eight hundred and eighty eight dollars. Quality cars at lower prices. So to think that's a hundred year old newspaper. It shows how well the mines can preserve things sometimes. And back here is other stuff you might recognize from videos. That's the dynamite door I took from the 500 level or 700 level. That's the dynamite door David Sparks and I found. And over here is the things from cutting in the road. You know, there's a little hair dye bottle. There's a couple of other bottles and things. And people often ask me what I do with the things that I find. And this is the answer. You know, they go in this museum. I don't sell them. I just think so much stuff has been taken or sold from Cerro Gordo over the years that any new artifacts I find, I want to stay here. And so hopefully one day, if you come up to Cerro Gordo, you'll see this even better stocked. But this is kind of our museum here, and it's something that I, uh, I really enjoy. Good morning, everyone. Thursday, halfway through the week, more than halfway through the week. So before I feed myself, obviously I had to feed all the animals. Hello guys, back, 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 back. How are you guys doing? Look at Gordo. Gordo's hungry, you're hungry. Levi, Levi the exploration cat. Meow, 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 you're becoming a real cat. That's awesome. You guys hungry? Enjoy folks. Everyone good? As you can see, there's been a great reduction of cats over the past few weeks. A lot have been adopted. All of the outdoor cats other than Levi have been adopted. And all of the kittens, well two of them other than this guy was adopted. My friend Ryan came to town and adopted two of the cats and the other cats were adopted by different volunteers. So I do is throw some over here so that way Elon can get some. And then I throw some over here for tofu. See how she knows because Elon can't be at both batches at once. So he's kind of stuck. And with them distracted out, we'll try to go get to the alpacas. Elon, he's just so aggressive that any food he has to, Elon, you have two other po food possibilities. Eat one of those. All right, alpacas there. Enjoy. I'm not playing your game, Elon. They're not playing your game either. Tofu's gonna eat all your food. God. No, 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 no. This isn't how this game goes. As you can see, it's never a dull moment trying to uh, feed the animals in the morning, especially with Elon's aggressive nature. The alpacas are super chill. So what I'm gonna do right now is just check to make sure they have water. Oh yeah, you guys have plenty of water. You got water, you got, you got more food. They're using their structure more, you can tell, which is cool because it's gonna get cold. The cats, the goats, the alpacas are all now set. So I'm gonna take a quick browse at the garden, see if there's anything that needs to be attended to. Quick check on the garden. You know, it is being drip fed, so I shouldn't have to do too much. This is looking a little bit uh, too watered almost. You know, it looks a little bit wet, so I might change the drip system a little bit. I might make some more holes in the bottom so it drains better. Um, but you can see some of the stuff is growing. Look at this. We got big boy tomatoes. This tomato plant was already growing when I brought it here, but those tomatoes weren't. So those are the first Cerro fruit. After a quick check, I think it's time to finally make myself some breakfast. So let's go back down and uh, get this day going. You know, one of my biggest ongoing battles since coming up to Cerro Gordo is just keeping on weight. You know, I naturally, I'm quite thin and up here, I'm always doing so much physical activity and there never seems to be quite enough food. And so one of my main battles in the morning is trying to make a really hearty breakfast, you know? And so I'm making leftover steak and eggs, I'll make that into burrito. And even in my coffee, uh, somebody gave me this protein shake stuff. So I'll make like a protein shake coffee, have that. And it's always just kind of a conscious battle I have to go through to try to keep the weight on. Cause I think since I've been up here and I don't have any weight to lose when I came up here, I think since being here, I've lost 20 or 30 pounds, which is insane to think about, uh, given that I was hoping to go the other direction. So, it's an ongoing battle, but I work on it every day. And I think this week I'm actually gonna work out for the first time in quite a while. And uh, yeah, we'll see. Maybe over the winter time I'll be doing less stuff. I might be able to pack on some of these pounds in anticipation of uh, the next season to come.
Voila. All right, uh, work took a little bit longer than I thought. It's noon now. I am now gonna show you guys the process that I go through to get supplies or to check my mail. This is my little two-wheel drive Tacoma. I have put some bigger tires on it, but it's still not great for running up and down the hill. All in, it's about, oh, 20 minutes from Keeler into Lone Pine. Downtown Lone Pine. We are gonna go over here to the post office. Well, it's quite the haul today. I guess I haven't been down here in a while. So what I'm gonna have to do is probably stage these in Keeler till I come down with a different type of truck. So this is, uh, this is the market, the Lone Pine market. All right, I went a little wild. I got an acai bowl and a green juice. It's going to be a long next few days. It's going to be a lot of work, a lot of cutting in. I never get fruits and vegetables, so I'm going to have these. Go over to a hotel parking lot and upload some video files. Welcome to where a lot of Ghost Town Living files are uploaded. The parking lot of a hotel. Don't worry, I'm friendly with the people that work here. So up here you have about, well right now I have one bar of AT&T service. And so what I use is an AT&T hotspot that basically reroutes the cellular signal for, to your computers. It's not great, you know, I can basically just send emails. There's not gonna be a lot of streaming or uploading. And so if I do need to upload a bunch of files, what I'll usually do is run into Lone Pine. Internet here is approximately 80 times faster than at Cerro Gordo. So if something would take, you know, an hour to download up here, it'd be 80 hours at Cerro Gordo. All right, I just opened up the mail and some really cool stuff. A lot of gardening stuff. Some really cool fertilizer, a portable mini greenhouse, a bunch of seeds, you know, we got seeds and seeds, some soil, which will all go to a great use. Food, which will also always go to great use. Brian sent me just a variety pack of just some awesome treats and some LaCroix that I'm probably actually gonna drink right now. Then I got this, which is beautifully done and amazing. All the stuff sent does go to use, some of it, even immediately, like it's LaCroix. I need some water, and so. Thank you all so much, anybody that said anything and just everybody watching. This will all come up to the hill with me tomorrow. But right now, me and that bike have a date on that hill, so I need to get back up there. So I was a bit delayed getting out the door, so I didn't go to my usual sunset spot. I went to my second favorite sunset spot and my legs feeling kind of bum, so I'm not gonna take a hike. I think I'm just gonna sit here, contemplate the day, and fly the drone a little bit. We'll take a, we'll take a hike with a little bit of technology called a drone, and you know, doing the sunset time lapse. I hope that comes out beautifully. morning it's friday whatever happened to rebecca black but i'm up a little bit earlier than i normally am some of the smoke is clearing and so i think i'm gonna go try to take a hike and catch sunrise i haven't done that in quite a while when i first came up here a year and a half ago i used to take this hike basically every morning you know it's one of the things I never had in the city. I never had views like this, never had the ability to just take walks like this within, you know, two minutes from my front door. I remember just being blown away every morning. And it's funny, I probably do this hike once every two weeks now, maybe a couple times a month. I don't think I've taken it for granted. It's more just as the projects pile up, 
it just doesn't seem like I have the time to carve out that, you know, 30 minutes, an hour to come and do this hike. Um, there's a lot more going on up here than there was a year and a half ago when I moved here. I don't know. I like this. I'm going to try in the next couple days to get out here and take this hike in the morning, see if it resets me a little bit. There's history just all around this. I mean, look at this old stone cabin. Think about how good he must have been to build something like that that's still standing 150 years later. So Friday of this week took a huge turn. If you watch this channel, you may already know that on Friday, Dave Sparks and the boys showed up and they gifted me with a five ton military truck. The thing is a beast, you know, it's able to haul, well, five tons at a time, which is gonna make moving materials for the hotel so much easier. Um, I'm not gonna bore you in this video with rehashing that. They came while I was filming this video, but if you're interested, the link is below in the description and we got into a lot of stuff. We had, you know, a five ton military truck, cleared a cabin site, had a steak lunch, went 900 feet down into the Union Mine, got the biggest artifact I've ever pulled out of the mine. All that and more, so that's below. And with that, it became Saturday. All right, welcome to Saturday. What I hope to do is finally clear the hotel site that I need to because there is gonna be some block delivered today. And then after that, if I have time, what I'm going to try to do actually is run down and take the five ton and go get some water to fill up our water tanks. Probably the most difficult thing about living up at Cerro Gordo is just the logistics of it all. You know, everything is difficult to get here. Living in an abandoned town with no running water at the end of a seven mile dirt road that's hours from any substantial store just reminds you about how difficult everything is to get and the planning that's needed each and every day. You know, I spend so much time each week just thinking about logistics. That's why I was so stoked yesterday when the Diesel Brothers brought this five ton truck, because this is gonna allow me to probably bring a thousand gallons of water at a time. And a thousand gallons of water is almost 8,500 pounds. So to get that up in regular trucks would be very difficult and very taxing on it. And I'm hoping that this thing does it with no problem. So I'm about to take this thing out and take it for a little bit of a spin, but it just made me think about all of the logistics of getting anything up here. You know, for a period of time, I was able to get water out of the mine here. Down at 700 foot level, there's a small pool of water. That isn't working right now. And so water, you know, the most basic of all human needs is pretty much at the top of that logistics checklist. And so hopefully this, running a thousand gallons at a time, will allow me to only have to do water runs I don't even know, once a month? I mean, we'll see, I don't use that much water. I'll show you guys my shower setup, kind of how I take showers currently. The water comes up on the truck, can go into a tank. I can pump it from there into this 55 gallon drum. And then here, I have hooked up basically an RV shower. So you can turn on the heater, turn on the pump, come over here, you can see the water is up and around. And then, ta-da! You know, one day, hopefully the water tanks outside will lead directly into this piping. You know, at the end of the day, after a long mine day, it's very, very nice to have a shower. All right, so just like I thought, you know, it's Saturday and uh, volunteers are starting to roll in. We got the clampers here. And uh, if you don't know what a clamper is, I'm gonna let them describe to you what a clamper is. All right, well, we're here from the Billy Holcomb chapter of E. Clampus Vitus. And what E. Clampus Vitus is, is they're a historical group that like, maybe likes to imbibe a little bit, but we go around and help restore and uh, preserve history. Put up a lot of historical monuments. You'll see our monuments at, at different historic locations. And when you see one and you read at the bottom, it says pl placed by such and such a chapter of the ancient and honorable order of Eclampus Vitus. That's us. And what chapter are you guys? Billy Holcomb. Billy Holcomb. This is our head obit for our off-road crew. <laughs> Mr. Mark German. Well, 
Appreciate all you guys being here. Thank you guys so much. All right, with that going on, I guess I actually have a change of plans. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna head back up to the hoist and try to service the guide rails for the skip because yesterday when the Diesel Brothers were here, we got stuck down at the 700 foot level. And what we think is happening is what previously was grease is turning into tar. So there's a lot of friction. So Tim's here, Brian's here. We're gonna go up there. And what we're gonna try to do is ride down on the skip painting new grease on it. Got the grease, got the rags. The idea is to stand on this and paint these as we're going down. All right, they're ready to go when you are. Copy going down. All right, as you can see, time to grease. Good luck. Take care of my cats. <laughs> They're the first thing to go. Oh, what the f <laughs> Tell my wife not to sell my motorcycles. <laughs> All right, so as you guys can see, that's uh, that's my feet. That's the cage. That's uh, guaranteed death. That's Tim. And the idea here is we're doing this. We're greasing to try to make it a little bit easier. Uh, Tim's having a double time right now, so I'm going to join in. And I will speak with you all later, but uh, we can live. I can't step back too far. Yeah, we can tie it in, so it's good. But look, two is one, one is none. Woo! Yeah, the grease has turned into tar. <laughs> all right, we're making our way down. We're probably at the uh, 600, 650. The real sticking point yesterday with the Dave's was around 705, 710. That's where we got stuck. So that's kind of our main area we're headed to today. This will be a fun ride because we're not in the cage, we're on it. Yep, but it'll be throwing you back and forth. Yeah, and then, you know, it's clipped in. Even we're our, actually doing safety today. Yeah, look, even our bucket's clipped in. So take that, safety people. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a 700, so it might start getting real interesting here in a second. It's getting a little bit jumpy. Yeah, it was a little bit further than this. It was probably past that next beam. It got, see? Oh. Yeah, the bottom of it's oh. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Those dog ears are about to engage. Fuck. Fuck. <laughs> no, we don't want that. Uh, it, 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 stop. Stop. Stop, 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 stop. You got slack. Pull it up. We got a lot of slack. And we're just hanging by those dog ears. So this is not good. A ton of slack. Oh, baby. That's not what you want to see when you're 700 feet down. Clamped into 150 year old wood. Oh, that's eerie, dude. Yeah. So we could just free fall. Are you not hearing me? You got to respond. He's, he's, he's lost radio, but he can see us. Oh. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, oh. Don't move around too much, I don't think. Oh, boy. This is where it gets real sketchy because they're going to unengage. Oh, yeah. Ready for this? Well, the cable's going to hold us, so. Yeah, but watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's... laughs> oh. Do. Maybe stop at the 700 and then, nah, or I don't know, go up and to create a better plan. Goodbye, 700 level. We tried to throw some grease on there so as it goes down next time, that's a day of greasing. We're headed back up. We're having some communication issues and some uh, smoothness issues, and so this is about the time where you GTFO. Get the f out of here. Greased, and we are uh, headed back up. Perfect. <laughs> Chunk. <laughs> Guide rail. Well, now I'm back out of the mine, you know, greased it up, and just in time for the delivery of some of the block for the new American Hotel. It's an exciting day. We got a whole crew there helping to unload, and this block that you see over there is going to go on top of this rebar. We're going to finally start building this uh, basement that's been taking so long. Hello. Looks like block. You like my hat? 
No. <laughs> you missed the fun, man. Yep, that's. I, I just missed it, huh? It was a good workout. Only 24 more pallets to go. <laughs> They're down there? I got the truck for it. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, got, I got the truck for it now. It's looking good. Sweet. So what's going on, Rick? It's contemplating. What, uh, what, what do I need to do? Do I need to flatten this? It just needs to be dug out. Okay. About how far? Uh, about 12 inches below the top of the footer. All right. Ugh. Started getting some of the dirt out of there. It's getting a little bit later in the day, so I'm gonna take a little break, drink some water, check in with everybody else. Make sure everybody else is good and uh, start figuring out some type of dinner plan. A little BTS of uh, how time lapses happen. It's Sunday, it's good weather. That means uh, people coming to visit the town. I'm getting a little later start than I would have liked to, but. So there's somebody in the general store. And weekends these days, if I wake up a little bit later, you know, let's say eight or nine, I sleep in. By the time I wake up, there's usually some visitor here checking out the town, which is great, but some days, just in full transparency, until I had a coffee or breakfast, sometimes you just want to go out and use the outhouse and not have a long conversation. So sometimes I just peek out to see if anyone's out there <laughs> and then uh, make a run for the outhouse. I think what I'm going to do first actually today, being Sunday, I'm going to go try to get talk to Roger and Cecil about the history of Cerro Gordo. And Roger and Cecil wrote a book called Cerro Gordo Images of America. And so this is my camera I use when I'm doing direct to camera. You can see it's been in some mines. It's pretty dirty, but it's a Sony A7. Uh, I have like a wide angle lens on it. And uh, it's my tripod. So a little behind the scenes and let's go uh, learn a little history. Some people said, yes, there was a, a murder a week. I think that's probably a little bit uh, exaggerated, but there were a lot of killings yeah. because you had uh, a relatively captive population with lots of alcohol and not too many women right. and a lot of tempers. Right. What could go wrong? And gambling, gambling debts. Yeah. Uh, you also had the danger, the weapons, you had what we, what we would today call Saturday night specials, very inexpensive, very inaccurate guns. And it, uh, people that were witnessing maybe a gunfight, you had almost as good a chance of getting shot as a combatant right. in a gunfight. Wasn't fight. there a guy that shot his own foot? Yes. So I always love hanging out with Roger and Cecil because they are just such a wealth of Cerro Gordo history. You know, history's why I'm here. You know, it's what drew me to this place. It's what I, keeps me at this place. That's amazing, you know? I'm excited for you guys to hear a little bit more of their tales over the coming videos. And I think for the rest of the day, I'm just gonna relax, you know? Try to enjoy my time here, you know? Try to just unwind from the week and maybe go play with the goats for a little bit, hang out with the cats. You know, I'm definitely gonna end tonight with a sunset dirt bike ride. That's my favorite way to put kind of a cap on the week. It allows me to zoom out of my laser focus of the week and just relax a little bit. So that's the plan for the rest of the day and uh, looking forward to it. You know, I can't think of a better way just to round out the week than a sunset dirt bike ride. I'm gonna take this drone. This is the drone I've been using. It's a Skydio. It's one that I like a lot. It follows me pretty good. So I'll take that along with me and we'll put kind of a 
bow tie on the week by doing one of my favorite things, riding a bike. There's something just totally freeing about being on the trail and looking at the mountains and allowing yourself just to zoom out of whatever you're so focused on this week. You know, for me, I get so wrapped up in what I am or am not doing, you know, how much progress is happening with the American Hotel and how much isn't. But to go back on the dirt bike and ride along a trail just makes me zoom out to remember the beauty all around me. You know, it forces me out of that tunnel vision and opens me back up to these dominating mountain ranges all around me. And I think about guys like Chet Reynolds, you know, whose briefcase I went through earlier in the week. You know, he too came out here with a dream and he looked at these same mountains. But I wonder if he missed the view. You know, if he ever allowed himself to just relax and unwind and in between all the lawsuits and leases and heartaches to just enjoy all the nature around him. I think if he did, then the whole thing wouldn't have been a waste. You know, if you love the process and try to remember that along the way, then you win even if your exact dreams don't come true. You know, you win in the fact that you become a better, stronger person from the journey. And that's what happened to me. You know, the only thing changing around here is me. These mountains will keep looking like this for thousands of more years. And many more will come to Cerro Gordo and see it as more than it currently is. And they'll see that untapped potential, you know, in the town and in them. And they might take these same trails that I do, just thinking through whatever their goal is for the town. And I just hope that, like I try to do, they take some time to appreciate it while they're in it, you know? That's just the best chance at having a full, rich life. Until next time, I thank you guys so, so much for checking out this video. That was a week in the life at Cerro Gordo. Next week, back with some more adventures, programming, renovations, all sorts of fun stuff. And until then, hope you all have a great week. Hope you go on some adventures of your own, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>